Good evening, and thank you for joining Creed Strategies for another edition of Creed Speaks. Today, we are going to be talking to several very esteemed education leaders uh, who range from vice principal, principal to deputy superintendent um, and consultant. So our theory or our program tonight is standing in the gap, black women leading education. And our first panelist is Ayanna Dixon, who is a graduate of Spelman College. She is also the assistant principal at Chelsea Career and Technical Education High School in New York City. Uh, her work at Chelsea, it focuses specifically on work-based learning and bridging the gap between what students learn in school and what they will do in their lives post-graduation. We are also joined by Karen Dunkley, who is an educator and transformational leader, as well as a social advocate. Um, Karen has served as a teacher. She's worked as um, a central office administrator, a deputy superintendent, high school principal. So she's got a proven track record of turning things around and hopefully she will share some of her insights and drop a couple of nuggets so that we can learn some things tonight. We've also got Krishan Fitzgerald, who is the principal at Highlands Elementary School in Wilmington, Delaware, which is part of the Red Clay School District. Krishan is known for her transformative leadership and her turnaround principles. And again, someone who we can learn a lot from. So with that, I just wanna say, hello ladies, welcome. And thank you for joining us today. Good evening. Thank you Thanks so much for having, for having us. us. It's wonderful to be here. Great to see you. Thank you. And so I will just kick it off um, with a question and feel free to whoever wants to jump in and answer, respond first, do so. Um, but my question is, what has shaped your evolution as a woman of color in education? And how would you describe your career trajectory? Let's not all jump in at once. <laughs> I'll, I'll certainly go first. It's, it's absolutely great just to be here to see everyone. Thank you so much, Sharon, the Sharon Wells. You are the truth for the opportunity to join my esteemed colleagues and congratulations to Creed. I, I, I stand in awe of the amazing work that Creed is doing to really transform education for our students and families. But I think about my trajectory as this education null leader, I have become, I have to confess that originally it was not my intention to enter the field of education. I had a double major. I majored in at St. John's University in political science and minored in education. And I was on my way to law school, took the LSATs. And what happened is I went to student teach I student taught at Elmont Memorial High School in Long Island, and I just fell in love with the kids. And the rest is history. And so every year I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna leave and go back. And then every year it was something else. And it was like, okay, I'm gonna finish this class and loop with them. And so here I am today. So when I think of my educational trajectory, I think just really, I have a heart for children. And I say that smilingly because we assume, it's an assumption that if you're an educator, you will have a heart for children but I really have a heart for children to focus on, as you know, Sharon Wells, what our mentor, Dr. Eileen Ackerman would remind us is to keep children and put children first. When I think about what has kept me in education, because my first year teaching was extremely difficult. And every day I taught at Community School 21 under the leadership of Dr. Renee Young, and she is the truth. And every day it was really, being a first year teacher is extremely difficult. And I kept saying, oh, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna quit. And I remember I met some veteran teachers and they said, don't you leave these children in the middle of the year. And they, the way they said it so sternly, I was shook. And then one year turned into two, turned into three and under the leadership of Dr. Renee Young. So my educational trajectory, it's, you know, the, the academic credentials really, are incidental. It was the social experiences, the mentorship of leaders like Dr. Renee Young, who instilled in us to have high expectations for children, 
Um, the mentorship of individuals like Dr. Arlene C. Ackerman, may her soul rest in peace, who really taught us how to fight in the struggle. And the peer mentors with you, Sharon Wells, is also having peers who are traveling in that journey with you and able to give support. Thank you. My goodness. <laughs> you took me back down memory lane when you said Arlene Ackerman. <laughs> yeah, I am originally from DC, and oh. she was actually my first superintendent. Oh. Um, I actually went to Howard University, and I enrolled as a speech therapy major because, for some reason, I thought that these people made so much more money than teachers. I said, "I'm going to go with the big money." <laughs> well, listen, there's only one lane on the other side <laughs> when it comes to the teacher salary schedule. So I found very quickly, but uh, I was I was running from the calling basically because I I see education as as, as a calling, education, teaching, and learning is a calling. We're called. We are special. <laughs> And that's, honestly, that was my trajectory. I started as a speech therapy major and um, I was a special ed minor. And then when I got to those methods classes, the methods of teaching and things of that sort. And then I want to say it was Bruce, was it Bruce Monroe? There was a school near Howard University and we would have our classes at the location and not necessarily on campus, which was really good for pre-service teachers. Um, and I fell in love. Now my heart, I was gone. I was done. I said, this is why I taught school when I was a little girl for this love, this passion, this compassion. And you know how you would go home and we tell those stories as educators and our family say, and you're going back tomorrow. Yes, because I love it. I just loved it. I loved it. And I have to be honest, um, it's the passion and it's when we see, I think, the mentors who've paved the way for us, when we see their work, the Carol Johnson, when we see their work, I'm going to shout out one of my best friends, Shonda Heary Hardman. Um, she worked in Chicago, HISD in Houston. Um, when we see the, 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 my brother-in-law, rest his soul, Manny Kalk, he was just a superintendent and he just passed in December. He was superintendent in Fayette County in Kentucky. When we see those and they're blazing trails and they're making good things happen for kids every day, that's what it's about. Taking care of your staff and making certain that you are making good things for people and for children and for generations to come, that, that begins the trajectory. That begins the passion and the compassion. And that's where I am. And that's, you know, that, that's how it was instilled in me. I was called to do this. We are called to do this. Karen, Ayana, we are called. We are called into education and we are special people. So I think first realizing really that we're called and seeing those who've paved the way. I had another mentor, uh, Marion Prophet, and she really took me under her wing when I came to Delaware. I taught in uh, the District of Columbia Public Schools. I taught in Prince George's County. Um, and I taught right, uh, love brought me to Delaware. Lord have mercy. But um, let me tell you something. We have some awesome leaders, leaders in the state of Delaware. Marion Prophet took me under her wing. And when I told her, I expressed my interest in um, educational leadership. She gave me a job to do. And she, I think she was hazing me. I said, Marion. <laughs> she said, do this and come back and see me. And after the job was complete, she said, we have been trying to get that done for 13 years. Wow. You did it in six weeks. She wow. said, now wow. I know that you're ready. She said, I know your heart is true. I know that you have the passion. So that trajectory really comes from good mentorship, watching other great leaders. Uh, pave the way, um, really watching and making sure when, when you see people doing those good things for kids and you see those good outcomes for children, that's, that's, that's what gets me, baby. That's what makes me up in the morning. You know, knowing that, yes, the work is yet, st it, it's still relevant. That's, that, that, that gets my trajectory. That's me. I love your stories, um, and it reminds me a lot about how I grew up. So I come from a family of educators. Um, uh, growing up when I was a little girl, I would hear stories about my great-grandmother on my father's side who, um, I don't know how she did it, but she, she left uh, Richmond, Virginia, and she came to New York. She got her master's degree in teaching, and she uh, retired from uh, as a teacher from, uh, in Richmond, Virginia. 
and that was, you know, um, I guess four generations ago now, but on my mother's side, her mother was, I guess we would call her a school aide. So she, you know, she worked as a kitchen, she worked all over the building. And when I would visit her, you know, it was a small town. So everyone in the community, all the kids knew my grandmother. And I just um, would get to hear so many stories about her interactions with them and how much um, you know, she meant to them, but then my parents are both educators as well, um, retired New York City teachers, and my dad was an administrator, so I grew up listening to all of the stories and hearing um, about what the students said, and, you know, just even hearing, they will still call them today um, and contact them on Facebook and tell them, you really touched my life, so, yeah, I grew up with it, and I, you know, they also kind of steered me away from it, and uh, I started out my career, actually the first 10 years of my career in news and entertainment media. And I had a lot of fun with that. Um, and, but I had to, you know, to make ends meet when we do, uh, I was living out in LA. Um, I started substitute teaching because it's, it's in my, my DNA. And um, like you said, Dr. Dunkley, I just fell in love with the classroom and the kids. Um, and I just couldn't run from it. Um, and so I, you know, I joined the teaching fellows in New York City and, and things just progressed from there. But I love it because every day is different. And, you know, like you said, it is a calling. It is, um, I, I think of it as sacred. Uh, the work that we do is divine. We spend more time with other people's children in a week, in a month, in a year, um, really than they do. And so the work that we do with them, um, with our students is just so important. And, you know, just to be able to um, see the development. Um, I had a student one time, and this was just such a challenge. She's in the sixes, I'm scared, you know, I'm not gonna pass the regents. And, you know, that's odd coming from a kid. I thought it was, I said, you are gonna pass the regents. And, you know, we just kept working on it. And she did. Um, and that was sort of my first story that I would tell. I would get to come home and tell my family. So, you know, for me, it's, it's just been um, something that, yes, I, I just believe it is a calling. It's just something that's in my DNA. But, yeah. Thank you. Um, we are fortunate to have Jamina Clay Dingle, Jamina. who is an assistant superintendent in the School District of Philadelphia, be able to join us as well. And so, um, Assistant Soup Clay, we are, or Jamina, we are just talking about um, what shaped your evolution as a woman of color in education. And how would you describe your career trajectory? And what is so interesting, right, is that the other three ladies on the, on the call, Ayana, Karen, and Krishan, have all said, and how coincidental is this, that becoming a teacher was never the plan. There was an alternate plan. And as I heard these stories, my soul connected because I too did not intend to become a teacher. I was on my way to law school. I was actually temping in New York City at um, Barnard because I was trying to, like Ayana said, make ends meet and pay the rent but at the same time figure out like, what do I wanna do? And I had taken the LSAT and I applied to law school and I also applied to the New York City Teaching Fellows Program, cohort three, five CC5. Um, and I said to myself, whichever one of these two programs I get into first is what God intends for me to do. Well, I got a letter from the Teaching Fellows telling me that I was rejected. So I was like, all right, law school has to work it has to work for me. And while I was um, at Barnard in the women's studies department doing my temp job, I happened to check the voicemail at home. And there was a message from the teaching fellows office telling me that they had sent me the wrong letter. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm gonna be a teacher. When I got home and checked my mailbox, there was an acceptance letter from Brooklyn Law School. So you know, I was like, teaching is what I am supposed to do because both of these things happened on this day. So just my little story on how I became an educator. Um, but Jamina, do you want to share? Yes, thank you so much. I apologize. I was having some connection uh, challenges as I'm, I'm actually currently out of the country. So I had some connection challenges and I'm so happy to join you all. Um, it, it is just an honor to, to be able to be here. As far as my trajectory, um, 
very similar. Uh, not only was I not supposed to be a teacher and go to law school, I actually went to law school. Um, I started in New York City as a New York City preparatory, provisional preparatory teacher, which kind of preceded the New York City teaching fellows. And I was an uncertified teacher. And um, my mom, I come from a family educators. My mom's a teacher, my aunt, everyone was a teacher. And when I came home from college, my mom was like, okay, well, what are you gonna do? And I said, I'm going to law school. And she said, that's great, but what are you gonna do now? And I said, well, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna spend the year studying for law school. And that just did not seem to connect with her. So she was like, well, you can go teach and go to law school at night. And so I started teaching with the intention of taking my LSATs and then going to law school at night. And I got into law school and was teaching during the day and going to law school in the evening. And I absolutely hated law school. I would, I, I had the best time during the day teaching my students. I was teaching in East New York, uh, sixth grade. I had 35 sixth graders that just every day was a great time with them. And then I would leave and drive out. I was at Torbo Law School and I would drive out to Huntington to law school and was just miserable. I was probably the only law student who was willing to cut class and go to the mall. That's how much I did not want to be there. And then after the semester, I said, this just isn't going to do it. And um, as a provisional preparatory teacher, I also had to take classes towards my teaching certificate. So I was actually taking law classes and education classes while teaching during the day. And the education classes just filled me up. And they just gave me everything I needed and I would take those classes and then go back because they were on weekends. And so I would take those classes on the weekends and Monday I would just go use everything I learned over the weekend in my classroom. And then in the evenings on Monday evening, I would drive to law school and just be as, I don't know why I'm here. And so after a while it was just like, why am I here when I hate it? And I just really wasn't enjoying myself. So um, shifted all of my focus into um, finishing my education degree, finished that from Dowling College on Long Island. Um, and then just continued. And, you know, it's, it's really been the, the position that I know I'm supposed to be in. Um, as I've moved through in different positions in different school districts, I spent several years in the New York City Department of Education. And then I taught in Westbury uh, School District on Long Island before coming down to uh, the Philadelphia area, working in Philadelphia schools. I worked at a charter school in the Philadelphia area, but I know that this is where I belong, right? I even took a couple of years off and worked for an educational management company. Um, and that felt good, but it wasn't with the kids. So after two years of doing that, I, I returned to the school district. And I remember in the process of returning, I said, you know, I always knew I had to come back. Like I knew that this would be home and I needed to be in schools, working with teachers, working with students. And that's how I got here. So, you know, it's interesting, and interesting is just the word that I'm going to use. As, as you're telling your story, I'm reminded of when you joined the team in Philadelphia. Um, and Dr. Karen Dunkley was also a part of our team um, with, with Dr. Ackerman and the Empowerment Schools. And she shaped the uh, Parent Academy that was a part of the district. But I just, I remember you coming in and you were ready to do whatever needed to be done for the students. And so I just, I, that, that stands out. And I, I really appreciate that about you and your educational commitment. I remember your interview. <laughs> Uh, Sharon, I just wanted to highlight something. I could not let this moment pass from Principal Kershawn Fitzgerald, and she spoke about Manny, and Manny was just such a great colleague, and I wanted just to honor him. I know we're here talking about women standing in the gap, but a part of us being empowered and being really, I would say, successful is having amazing allies, and he had such a passion and heart for the young people that whatever, because I worked with him when I was in central office, both when I was in parent and family as a deputy and deputy chief academic officer, and he was just remarkable. And I just wanted to use this moment just to honor him because I said, this is truly ordained Sharon Wells, because here we are connected and we use the term. And I looked at it and I said, don't overthink it. What was your evolution? And in evolution, there's revolution. There's an opportunity to change things for the better, for the good. And I think that we have a unique opportunity as Black women. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I, I just to piggyback on, on Karen, um, Krishan, as you were talking about Manny, Karen and I both like our faces lit up because working, and Manny was actually my direct supervisor, uh, but working with him, I learned so much. I learned that education isn't just about teaching. This is a relationship business.
And we can't get anything done for the children if we don't build relationships with each other as well as with the kids. So yeah, thank you for doing that, Karen. Um, I, I wanna ask the question and since um, Karen brought us to the connectivity and relationship and Krishan, as you were talking, you talked about, you named several of your mentors. And so I, I just, I wonder, and I, I'd like for you all to talk about um, who has inspired you in your career? And I'll just leave it at that. Like who has inspired you? What role has mentorship played for you? And how do you turn that back around and mentor others? Or what, what nuggets would you give aspiring leaders now? That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, thank you so much for paying tribute to my late great uh, brother-in-law. I miss him so much. Yes. Uh, anytime I had a problem or a concern, I'd say, Manny, <laughs> this is what's happening. And they would hate for us to sit near each other at Thanksgiving or at Christmas or at Easter. <laughs> say, oh, God, the educators, here they go. <laughs> You'll never get them to stop talking, but I could never get him to stop talking about what he was passionate about. And, you know, that's what we have to remember is, is the passion, it's the love, it's the compassion for people, for children, for the human condition. And I think we do have to see education as more than just the bricks, the mortar, more than just the learning and the and the and the books and the pencils. It, it it is a calling. It is a compassion. It's a passion and it's a work of the heart. And I would say that because Manny was definitely a, a mentor. I don't know if he knew it, but I watched what he did. I would watch his media. I would watch um, his articles, any media outlets and things of that sort. He was definitely a mentor. And I would definitely say to females, you know, and women of color, you know. We can have mentoring experiences, meaningful mental mentoring experiences outside of our race and outside of our gender, right? We, we cannot be opposed to just Black women and to the sister friendships. That, that's my one bit piece of advice. But I did have lots of mentors along the way. Uh, Marion Prophet was my mentor here in Delaware. Um, I would say I looked to my principal when I was in high school, Frank H. Stetson, Dr. Stetson at Duval Senior High School in Prince George's County Public School System. He was amazing. Um, I did watch Arlene Ackerman. She was amazing when I was in DC in the District of Columbia Public School. She was a fireball. <laughs> she really was. She really, really was. Um, Carol Johnson, when she was the superintendent of Baltimore BPS, um, my line sister, Shonda Huey Hartman, she was a uh, deputy uh, under uh, uh, Carol Johnson, and she's been a great uh, mentor and friend. Uh, the one thing I've also learned as I've as I've gotten older is I have different mentors for different areas of my life. I'll have a mentor for work. Uh, I found it very helpful to have a mentor, even uh, spiritually, uh, to help guide my work. Because if I'm not centered spiritually, um, then my work is is off kilter. Um, and I've also found it very, um, very helpful to have um, accountability partners, right? So you'll have your mentor, you have your coach, but then you also need a group around you to hold you accountable. Are you saying that you're actually, you, you said this in January, but are you actually doing that, right? Um, and I'll tell you a big secret. I used to have a problem with taking care of myself, right? I really did. I thought as a principal, when I first became a principal, I had to be the first one in the parking lot and last. And I had to learn to balance that because my doctor said, okay, you might be doing pretty good as a principal, but let me tell you something about your health. You're almost diabetic. And before 50, you'll be on medication. So I had to find some, uh, in addition to that mentoring and that coaching, I had to have some accountability partners around me. Um, because you can't take care of anybody else's children before you take care of yours. Because like my friend Ayana said, uh, you know, you're going to spend more time or quite a bit of time with grooming all of these other children and all these other children's families and things of that sort. But if you don't take care of your own and if you don't take care of your own temple, 
right? That we're not good to anybody. So I needed that accountability. And so that's a, that's a little nugget that I would give to an aspiring leader or to someone who is in leadership. Make sure you have not only your mentor, or your coach, but make sure you have people who hold you accountable. You know, even when you're not, sometimes you get, I don't want to say get tired or get weary. Sometimes we do get weary. Sometimes I need somebody to say, uh-uh, you said you were going to do this in January. And we have to see this work through. So I think that accountability partnership, along with the mentorship, has definitely helped me. And of course, it takes a team. I couldn't do it without my husband. My husband is amazing. I love that man. I love my husband. You know, it, it takes support, you know, and my husband is very supportive. My mother-in-law, my family, but it takes a team. It's not just that mentoring and that coaching. You need accountability partners. You need strong support. It's a team. It's a team effort. And I am ever grateful. Yeah, I would, I would definitely co-sign on that, needing a team and having accountability partners. And I think a lot of times when we think of mentors, we always think that the person that's going to mentor us or inspire us has to be further along in the career than we are, right? Some of my biggest inspirations are those people I've worked alongside, um, that are just like in the field doing the work. When I think about people who inspire me, I think about um, the principal who took the principalship after I left Bethune Elementary School, Aaliyah Bradley, uh, Tammy Stewart Grimes out of Claymont, Delaware. These are ladies who are carrying buildings that are doing the work. And when they speak about the work, they speak with a level of commitment to our children that's unwavering, unapologetic. I think of Passion Jackson, she runs a charter school in the Philadelphia area. There's Janine Hendricks who runs a Wright Elementary School in North Philadelphia. And, I, and it's funny you mentioned how we met Sharon, but when I always think about people who have inspired me and moved me into this work, I don't have that conversation without mentioning Sharon's name because Sharon really was one of the first people that I worked alongside and as a supervisor, who spoke about our commitment to children in the way that made it okay to say that, you know, it's children first before the, you know, the conveniences of adults come the best interest of children. And she always held that bar really, really high for the people who worked with her. And so she's an, I consider her an inspiration to me, but I think when I think about the people who inspire me, it's the principals and the leaders. There is an English teacher at Martin Luther King High School, Angie Crawford, extraordinaire. And when she speaks about the children and the families she works with, she is unapologetic that I am here for these families and this community first. And the conveniences of the adults can fall in line behind that. And so when I think about the, the people that inspire me, that mentor me, that I call on and, and ask for, like for Sean said, that, that accountability, that tell me, okay, you know what, take care of yourself, pour into yourself do this, you said you was gonna do this, take care of yourself. Those are the people I go to, those are the, the people I listen to, those are the sisters that lift me up. And even when they don't know it, like I reached out to um, the English teacher, Angie, the other day, she is one who takes her personal health so serious that she works out no matter what. And I reached out to her after you know, I started to recommit myself. I said, you don't even know how you've inspired me to put me first and to take care of myself. But that's another piece of just, you know, you never know who's watching, right? And you never know how they're going to inspire you. Um, so I don't always think like, you know, of necessarily somebody that has to be further along in their career than I do. I'm inspired by the people who are committed to doing the work every single day. And, you know, as far as like, how, what would I tell somebody I'm mentoring? Um, or how would I tell somebody to find a mentor? You know, don't be afraid to ask. You know, some of the people I work with, I, I've coached that I mentor, I just came to me and said, listen, you know, I'm, I need a mentor. Like, you know, what, 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 here's what I, here are my goals. Here are things that I want to work on. And as, as somebody who, who takes it very seriously, sometimes I say, okay, we can, we can do this work. Let's get into it. Let's set a plan. Let's do the work. And I've also told people, okay, I might not be the right mentor for you. Right. And that's okay too. But I got somebody for you. If it's not me, let me send you over here because I think that this person can give you what you need. You know, thank you for saying don't be afraid to ask we actually have a question in the chat that says how would you've talked about being the mentorship but how would you go about asking someone to be a mentor so thank you for adding that yeah i actually and, and and to that point i saw the question in the chat i did have somebody who inboxed me said can i just grab 10 minutes with you and i you know set up appointment and called her she said i need a mentor right and she's 
She's been working on a couple of different things and a couple of different career uh, choices she wants to make. She said, I need somebody to toss this around. Can I get some time with you? Mm -hmm. And I, I do see part of my responsibility in making myself available to sew back into sisters when they, when they ask these questions. So we have a set of time on our calendar and we check in regularly and I'm saying, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Here's what you need to do. Here's some suggestions. Here's some things you can work on. And then we check and we see how it's going. We make the shifts as necessary. But she made the, the effort to just reach out and say, hey, look, you know, mm -hmm. when I think about people doing this work that I look up to and I'm inspired to, you you rise to the to my list and I'd like to work with you and, and ask you for mentorship. And and now we're we're getting the work done. And it's fascinating to to have that transition because I remember when individuals started to reach out to me and I was like, wow, this is what I used to do with, you know, different leaders. And when I think about Dr. Arlene Ackerman or Dr. Renee Young or Dr. Penny Nixon, I'm like, wow, now. And so you're in this interesting, I would say, space where you now begin to gift others with your experiences and your wisdom. So it's that term we like, you know, where we say we lift in as we climb, because that's the part of building the pipeline for those alongside you or behind you to come. And so I would never let the moment pass without paying homage to my mentors. First of all, thank God she was, she, she deserves to be sainted. Dr. Renee Young, my first principal at Community School 21 in Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, honey. She probably should have fired me as a first year teacher, but patient, she saw in me what I did not see in myself. And I'll share a quick anecdote when i was a teacher they there's a great group and everyone well those who are educators because we're, we're on social media so if not it's where the teachers in the great group come to talk about best practices for the young people we serve and i would never go to grade group and she came to my room and she said miss dunkley shouldn't you be at the grade group meeting i was like dr young i i don't need to go to grade group i said i haven't figured out i have my lesson plans i said i don't need to go to grade group there's nothing that you know i'm going to take away and she said, if you want to stay at this school, you better go to the grade group meeting, honey. Them teachers, they told on me. And let me tell you, I went to grade group. It changed my life. Those teachers were brilliant and understood teaching and learning and, and student engagement and discipline. And that's the anchor I had. So I think your peer leadership is so key. And then there's this kind of leadership that happens with those who are wiser and smarter. I'm also a part of a group, you spoke about Aaliyah Bradley, a sister circle. And uh, Sharon Wells, I don't know if you know uh, Dr. Monica George Fields from Reach. She was also at Columbia with us. Mm -hmm. But they invited me, Dr. Kuswell Lassane, into a sister circle. And alongside Dr. Monica George Fields, who's been just a great, I admire her so deeply, is this individuals like Elisa Delpit in that sister circle where you get to see them in a different way and interact with them and just have them continue to be what Principal Fitzgerald called critical friends. You know, your accountability. So while you're doing the work, they're also challenging you to do better and be better and stay in the fight for kids. So I think that that's important because sometimes we think we're here by ourselves and we're not. And I have to tell you, Wells, you know, you, you were one of those. You would ask the questions that were sometimes uncomfortable and i think that people had difficulty processing but it was the questions that you were asking that would push us to do better to be better to think critically and i think it's important to say that because sometimes group thing sets in and we want to be comfortable but i remember we've got to fight for kids we've got to upset the apple cart and every time i think about dr ackerman children come first parents are our partners victories in the classroom it stays and when you're in leadership especially at the school level and in central office and now as a consultant you have to remind yourselves and stand you have to have your absolutes like on these things i will not compromise because i came through a arlene ackerman i came through a renee young i came through a penny nixon i had a cheryl alt as a math coach because i had a sharon wells as a colleague right a dr monica george fields and not only women there have been men we spoke about manny Kwok, dr Kwok, dr bernard gastaway um dr lester young dr rudy cruel like those are all individuals who would pour into us to fight for kids so we're standing on that strong foundation and we're going to lift as we climb 
love that. I'm inspired just by listening to all of you. And, um, you know, I was inspired by um, someone named Dr. Lorraine Moreau. She was a, um, mm -hmm. a dynamic, dynamic, you know, uh, educational leader. Um, and I didn't attend her school, my brother did, but I got to meet her and, you know, just the way she carried herself, the stories that she told, uh, I think the name of her book was um, Nothing's Impossible. I mean, that that really stuck with me. And, you know, going to Selma College Fair, you know, being under the leadership of Jeanette X. D. Cole, I mean, wow, powerhouse, um, dynamic female leader. But I, I, I think that, you know, I always have to give um, honor, I should say, to, um, Karen Watts. She is um, an executive superintendent now uh, in, in New York. But at the time, I was coming up for tenure. Um, I, I got denied the first time I was coming up for tenure. And she came to my classroom and I was so nervous. Um, you know, I thought she'd be there for a few minutes. And she stayed for a while. Um, and my principal, another wonderful uh, Black female education, uh, educational leader, uh, Andrea Piper, uh, she said, uh, uh, you know, uh, Superintendent Watts, she stayed for a while, you know, I, I wound up getting my tenure. Um, and then she invited me to speak at several conferences after that. And, you know, she never really spoke to me one-on-one -on -one personally, but she opened up doors of opportunity for me. She um, recommended me or well, recommended that I apply um, to the LEAP program, um, which is how I became an assistant principal, I never, 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 never would have imagined that I would be uh, an assistant principal. You know, I said I didn't even think I would teach at first, but, you know, people said, you, you love the kids, you work with the kids, but you don't want to work with the adults. That's, that's, that's hard. Um, but I love it. And I just, you know, I appreciate that. And I try to pay that for because I appreciate that she saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Um, and, you know, I try to do that for our students. That meant a lot to me, I would say, just to make a connection because um, I, did, I did grow up in New York City and I attended um, a high school that was predominantly white and I encountered quite a bit of racism there. I had dynamic black teachers there actually, which is a little ironic, um, Dr. Mason, uh, um, who was my sixth grade teacher, Patricia Lambert, who was my first grade teacher and became a principal at Hunter Elementary School. But, you know, I didn't have a lot of people that saw something in me, you know, both people did. So I saw a common denominator there. But, you know, the thing that I, I would say, just to, to go back to your, the other part of your question is, I tell teachers and especially any other leaders um, that I meet, you know, you have to be courageous. And there is that book, um, Courageous Conversations About Race. Race and institutional racism, I say you have to speak to it, you have to confront it, and you have to take up space as a Black woman, as, a, as whoever you are, you have to speak to that. And we are in a position to do something about the injustice and the inequity that is um, that we find in our institutions. And so, you know, I was harmed by it. So I try not to do any harm to other people's children, but I also try to encourage the next generation to speak to that and to do something about changing it. Ayanna, you raised an excellent point. I, we also should acknowledge that it's not only whites. I think that sometimes black educators can be just as harmful to black children. You know that mm -hmm. phrase they said, every skin folk ain't kin folk. I have met some black educators and they want us to be, you know, it's that carryover from slavery. We've got to be harder on the kids. We've got to punish them. You know, we have to vilify them. And so, so I think we have to call them out also, you know, so I'm, I'm, we're calling them out. And, oh, and, and you spoke about courage. I love it. And I remember Nikinj Gilliam, the only reason I always say, how did I get tenured? Because so many of us sometimes are experiences in, they're, the experience live in these very white spaces and we're under this white gaze. And I had a great colleague when I was teaching high school 
McKinj Gilliam in Long Island. And it's only because of her, because I did not read, I was not attuned to the informal language of the school. And she taught me the informal language, how to survive and thrive beyond that white gaze and the low expectations and the fact that as black female leaders, we have to carry water in baskets on our head. And she challenged me. And I always tell her every chance I get, thank you. That's awesome. So, you know, I really, I really appreciate that you, you called out the fact that it's not always educators um, who, who aren't Black that can, that can be spirit killers of our children. And I just think it's important to, 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 to mention that and to like and just to emphasize what you said that it's our responsibility as educators to protect our children from that, regardless of who they come formed as, right? To, to be that barrier, to be, to make sure that they don't, they don't, you don't get a chance to come into this space where children should feel safe and loved and valued and heard and tear them down. And that as educators, it's our job to disrupt that when we see it and we should feel bold. And that is something that I would tell aspiring leaders, you should feel courageous, comfortable and bold enough in your school, in your classroom, to stop anyone who comes in seeking to, uh, to destroy and harm the spirits of these children that we have in front of us. It is a great responsibility. I know I heard that before. This is a great responsibility and is one that we take on and therefore it is our job to make sure that we fill children up every single day with love and that they feel safe. And, and I think that sometimes we forget that, right? Sometimes we think that, oh, because you know we have black educators in front of our children, they're gonna be okay. And that's not always the case. And it's okay to call that out. And it's okay to say you will stop or this isn't the place for you to be around these children. So as women who are leading education and leading teachers, leading students, working with families in environments where there are black and brown people, how do you inspire your staff and how do you support them in being able to meet the needs, the diverse needs of all of our students? I think that uh, that's a very important question, particularly right now during this time, right? During this season, the new uh, Jim Crow, if you will, or the new, you know, you took us there, Ayana. <laughs> I came to talk some talk, honey. <laughs> Speak well, on I, it. Speak on it, Principal. I think girl. we have to be honest, ladies. <laughs> this is the rookie on the team. Just opened it up. <laughs> I, I I think that you know from the events that we all witnessed, and we all knew, mm, but never had the urgency to really address. I think now this is the season, this is the time, right? And I think if we had this conversation and did not mention cultural competence, we would really have a, a, a really null and void night, right? We, we would really be a disservice. And I think that it's really, really important. It's really, really key. Um, and I was very proud of my district. We were the first district to hire an equity officer, Dr. Tawanda Bond. Um, I think it's really, really key to have that conversation on every level, at the district office, at the, at the central office level, and even at the school level, right? It's time for us to have that conversation about cultural competence, right? With urgency. If there was ever a time, if there was ever a season, I think that, you know, although we've been in the COVID space for a while, I think God does everything for a reason, and we could not do anything but stop and watch CNN, MSNBC, whatever you watch, whatever your media outlet was, we stopped and we saw it, we witnessed it, and now we have to address it and stop pretending not to know. Yeah. Ladies. 
It's really powerful. We just wanted to hold a moment, right? Not pretending not to know. Because when you say you don't know, it gives you the excuse to say you're ignorant. But now that we do, what's next? And that's the challenge. That's the conversation. And that's the action that is required. So thank you so much for stating that so eloquently and elegantly. Sharon, in, in terms of when you talk about how do we really mobilize and, and bring about consensus when you work with staff, especially if culturally, it's not only race because culture is class, um, culture is so many different things. You know, it's experiences, it's certainly social um, economic status, it's, it's, it's language, like even teaching our young people to code switch. One of the important pieces is to see each other. And let me tell you what I mean by that. I think sometimes if I see my staff and they see me, then we could do a better job of seeing the children because we cannot do for the children what we can't do for ourselves. And, and, and that's hard work. That doesn't live in the head. It's not what we could teach. That's the emotional intelligence and that's the social intelligence piece. So we could really look at a person and understand and have value and have a human connection about who we are. And I think that that comes from storytelling. How do we create spaces in the school environment, in the school culture to tell our stories as individuals? And how do these stories shape a collective? And how can the children share their stories with us? So it's reciprocity. And Dr. Young used to say, we're not better than the children. So some of us come in and think we're saving or we're doing the children a favor. And I learned that from her. And I started to echo that we're not better from the, than the children. We're not doing, you're getting, this is a job. Yes, it's, it's, we say it's more than a job, but meaning that, you know, you, you are opting to be here, right? And because you're opting to be here, we're going to hold you to this set of expectations. And again, it's having the courage to do so and not giving anyone a back door. So I think that there has to be some storytelling. And then I think there has to be some honest labeling. These are as a teacher, here is what I will not do. I will not compromise on these things. As a leader, these are my non-negotiables and we stick to that. And the children should know it, the families that we serve should know it, and those who we work with should know it, and we should know it. Sometimes if we as Black women leaders, if we don't know who we are, then it's hard to translate or convey a message because we are searching for ourselves. And so even though we're always in evolution, we should know our core. So one thing that you know, like, like I am clear about is high expectations. When you begin to tell me just because the children are this or that, then that is more a reflection of you than on them. I, when I was a teacher, I proved this. So they did tracking in my high school that I taught and they gave me the regular kids and then they had the advanced kids. So I did a trick on my lesson plans. I would put seven advanced eight advanced. So the kids were like, Miss Uncle, are we the advanced? Because they're saying we're not the advanced. I'd be like, what do you mean? I said, I'm an advanced teacher. How, how, how dare you? How dare them say we're not advanced? And don't you know that my cohort of students perform better than the so-called advanced? Because then they used to have that eighth grade assessment, remember, in social studies, and which is now eliminated. And I never forgot that. So children believe us. And if we give them a message of high expectations and we hold everyone accountable, including ourselves. So that's how we get to it. Because it's, I used to say this, love is not enough. We could say we love children all we want. In my school, I, I had black children. I had Asian children. And I had some whites and I definitely had children of Latinx descent, right? So we could say, oh, we love the kids. But I would always say, love is not enough. If you love me and you can give me a D and that is okay with you, then that's not love, right? That's patronage. That's condescending. That's the bigotry of low expectations. If you could bring in bags of candy, but you can't write a lesson plan and teach me how to read, then I don't want that kind of love in my building. You know, you could take that kind of love in somewhere else. So let's just clear all this up. Everything's on the table with my sisters today, <laughs> right? Over to the team. <laughs> I totally agree with you. And I think, um, you know, 
a lot of it is about building personal relationships. And I think you spoke to that, Sharon, um, you know, building relationships with your staff, really getting to know them, talking to them, having, you know, lunch, whatever you, you can. Um, just to get the, 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 you know, the conversations going so that people can feel comfortable and honest in their truth. Because I want to go from there to addressing the, the issue. So maybe you have this deficit model thinking. Um, the, the children can't learn or, you know, they, they failed. I mean, you know, now we're in COVID and, you know, well, the kid doesn't do their work. They haven't done their work. Well, what have you done to make sure that they've done their work? And now that's not even enough because I'm going to sit with you and we're going to come up with a plan and some ideas and some strategies. I'm really, really big on strategies. If, if I talk to a teacher and she's telling me she's teaching, you know, kids how to write an essay, I'll, I'll ask, well, how, what, what's your strategy for teaching how to write a, an intro paragraph? You know, what are the strategies? You have to have some things in your toolbox. And so, you know, teacher education, ongoing professional development, that is not just, you know, you know, just, I don't wanna, I don't want to say yes, but just, you know, some time and people making money, but something that is going to help you to walk away with some skill and some information that you can put into practice. Because then, if we've had the conversations and we have the relationships and you have the skills and, that, you know, you have the opportunity to, to um, you know, grow and develop and implement those skills and you still are not making any progress with the kids, then maybe this isn't the right environment for you. Maybe there's another, you know, position somewhere else that you, because you're harming the students. And I totally agree with you about the love. There are some people who love the kids. I mean, they really love the kids, but you have to know your content. Know your content. Love your content. You may be passionate about your content, but know how to teach your content. That is a completely different skill. So. No. Yeah, I, I would add to that, you know, making sure that you as the leader set the expectation and model the expectation, right? So we know that we're here to make sure that our children walk away with the skills and the abilities. And then we're going to model that in every aspect of our leadership, how we talk about students, what we accept from our teachers. It's modeled. And I have a leader now that I work with. And one of the things she tells her teachers is, don't ask me, how can I fail them? Ask me, how can I help them? right? Don't even come to me with that because that's not an option. How can I help him? And she says, she tells that when the teachers come to her and say, well, what can I do to fail him? Or, you know, can I suspend them? She says, no, can you help him? Can you help him? Because that's what we're here to do. We're here to help our children not to cause them harm. And what she does by using that language, she sets the tone and the expectation for the building. You're not going to come into my building and have a list of ways that I can fail children, that I can suspend children, that I can separate children from their learning environment. We're gonna come in here and problem solve and find ways that we can help children, that we can fill in the academic gaps, that we can ensure that they are receiving the learning that they're supposed to receive. And that's all we're gonna talk about. And no other conversation is gonna be brought to this table when it comes to working with our children. So I think also as a leader, you know, one of, one of the things we have to do is make sure that we are exemplifying it and we hold it, we speak it, we walk it, and people see it, it just, it just for, pours, pours out of our pores, right? That everybody sees and they feel it, that these are the expectations in this building. So you all have talked about cultural competence, deficit-based thinking, loving on the children in a way that maximizes their potential and their ability to excel. And there's a question in the chat is completely connected to that, which is how have you gone about creating a positive environment and a positive school climate culture um, on your teams? So yeah, what are some of your strategies for that? I'll speak to that and I can't take credit for it um, as the assistant principal. My principal, um, Javel Reed at our, our high school, um, you know, he implemented Wellness Wednesdays for the staff. So for example, uh, in the morning, we'll have something for the teachers. During the day, we'll have something um, for the students. And then in the evening, we'll have something for the parents as well. So I, I think, I don't remember who it was who uh, mentioned something about taking care of it. I think it was you, um, Dr. Fitzgerald. 
you said um, that you weren't very good at taking care of yourself in the beginning. Um, but taking that time, we do, you know, meditation, breathing, um, exercise, all of those things um, to just create an environment where people are taking their health um, into consideration and, and they know that that is something that is important. And, and then hopefully that is gonna trickle down to the kids because the kids, um, they're suffering. We're all suffering. We've all been suffering. This has been really, really hard. Um, but it's not every day in a school that you get to carve out specific time out of the day because we, we have a very limited amount of time, but that you with intention, you know, create that space. So that's one, one thing. That's great. I like that intentionality, creating that space. I think that, again, we have to take care of the adults so they can take care of the children. If we are mean and if we're not considerate of adults, of course, there's accountability, but there's also support. There's also understanding because then it becomes displaced and it filters down to our scholars, right? And so as a leader, that was really important for me to set the tone. I remember Dr. Nixon, when I was becoming a principal, she was saying, Karen, I used to like every morning, I used to go to each classroom and I would say good morning. And when I got to Parkway Center City, every single day without fail, I would go to every single, every single classroom and say good morning how are you doing to that teacher and if i knew like they had a difficult day or family i would just check in and that made all the difference in the world because again we're seeing each other so we're building that connection so that we can help to support children so that can now include our students and the families right that we serve and i think that that's key and another component in terms of spirit building and nurturing is to make the school environment fun i think sometimes you know we wonder like how do children go from wanting to go to school to not wanting to go to school it's the kind of environment so even though Parkway was very structured, I am a Caribbean person, I am about structure and discipline. What we would say is when you come into this building, because your children, they go through so much trauma, we would have a consistent message. All you have to do is be a young adult. We don't need you to make any decision outside of what impacts your educational career. And so we would do just school pride and individual pride. We would have messages in the bathroom. If you go in the bathroom on the steps, every Friday we would have a little song and the scholars could submit songs, the teachers. So just those kinds of things, you know, being in the lunchroom with them. And you know what happened? The, the teachers had a culture. They would come out in the hallway and they're supposed, they're not supposed to, but they would come out, it made a difference. We would greet the kids in the morning, walk up to the top where we were. Um, you know, we'd go up to the Dunkin' Donuts or the subway. They'd be like, don't please come and run. So it's building that. When the families answer, we say, thank you for calling Parkway Center City High School. How may we be of service to you today? Right, so we're changing the conversation how we talk, how we greet each other. And I'm telling you, it really made such a difference. And going back to where, once we change the mindset that school is not a punishment, that if you do something wrong, we make mistakes, we're going to do discipline, right? But that discipline you're gonna learn so it doesn't happen again. And we, after a while, we, I'm, when we never had fights. And one year we had a fight because that was the goal. We said no fights this year. And you know what we did? We held a moment of silence and the kids were like, don't leave. I said, no, this is a sad day. And I was carrying on. And we said, we're gonna hold a moment of silence. We said, this is sacred ground and our sacred ground has been contaminated. And it was a mindset and a shift. So it's important as we spoke about, I think uh, you spoke about it, Jamina, the modeling. And we have to model that, we have to live it. But Malcolm Gladwell says, in order for a thing to be successful, we have to think about it all the time. There has to be one person. And that was me. My husband would say, he was like, you were always Parkway, 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 Parkway. He said, you were married to Parkway. Now I'm not saying that's healthy now, Principal Fitzgerald. You spoke about balance and self-care. 
However, in terms of building positive culture, you have to be positive and it trickles down and be infectious, but be authentic. Let people know if you're concerned, be real. Let them know if you're upset. If, you know, like the, the scholars should know and the teachers and you can have righteous indignation. And we would say Parkway Center City can't do it. It cannot be done. And I would say no other high school in Philadelphia is as magnificent as Parkway. And we, and I believed it, I, I, I believe it now. I believe it then and I, I know it to be true now. And that's contagious. And that's the belief system that we have to live. And that's how we get to positive school cultures. And we have to affirm kids. Black people in America has been fed a diet. And you spoke about the Sharon wealth of self-hate, internalized racism. We don't like ourselves. We're harder on the black woman principal. We're harder on the black teacher. We're harder on black kids. And we have to, you use the word interrupting, Jamina Clay and Ayanna Dixon, you spoke about. Um, you know, just really maximizing that energy in, in the school, we have to interrupt that narrative. We are just as worthy. We're not any less innocent. We tend to adultify our kids like they're less innocent and, you know, and, and they're just going out looking to do wrong. So I think it's all of those pieces. It's a simple question, but it's a big answer. But it's an easy answer because we can control that. Regardless of what's happening at district office, we control what's happening in our buildings and we're the closest to the kids. You know, and, and Dr. Dunkley, I 100% I co-sign and agree everything that you just said, especially about making school places that kids want to be. In, mm -hmm. in a lot of our, in our schools, particularly in our urban areas, school is just a place where kids have to be. We have taken all of the things that make school exciting away from our children. So having those fun moments, topping the 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 constant drill for the test preparation, stopping all of the the rigid um, discipline that we have in our elementary buildings where kids gotta walk in lines and bubbles in your mouths and hands behind your backs, and just make school fun. Like here's a place where this school was built and designed for children not for test scores, not for discipline, not for order, but children who are wiggly at times, who make mistakes at times, who have desires to do art and music and, and movement and put that in the building so that children have a reason and an enjoyment about school and stop making school the punishment, like you said, right? Like, you know, we have, we all know the schools where the children do something wrong and they have to sit down and read. Well, now we've made reading a punishment. Reading's not a punishment. We wanna make sure that children love learning for the love of learning, not learning to finish the task or learning to finish the test, but putting those things back into school that help develop the whole child and welcome the child and make the, the school someplace that's warm that children want to be. And we, we, we unintentionally, intentionally, it's a whole nother panel discussion, have removed so many of these parts from our schools that our children are there just, they don't have that space that their white peers have in their buildings you know i remember once i went to visit my son's school and there were kids literally at the back of the line doing cartwheels and no one said a word to them now cartwheels aren't safe we all know that but they were no one said anything about them being wiggly little children but then we go back into our schools and we have a bubble in our mouth and our fingers over our lips and our hands behind our backs and don't move don't touch we paint all these murals on the walls but you're not allowed to look left or right you got to look forward at all times right so make schools for the children that we designed the schools to be for and stop trying to regulate and, and create these orderly spaces where children don't get a chance to be kids. Absolutely. I have to say that was a loaded question because it, it like Dr. Dunkley said, it's, it's a loaded answer. But if you think about everything that all of the panelists have said, it doesn't cost money. Nothing, it, it, that, that answer, it doesn't cost money. It takes intentional courage. Here are my core beliefs. When everybody comes, we're going to be respectful, responsible, ready, and rising. Uh, we're going to be peaceful, positive, and productive. It doesn't take money, right? Yeah, intentional courage. I don't like the way that I'm not so certain about the, the way that you answer that phone because that, that doesn't align with our core beliefs. I'm not so I'm not so certain what the way the way this referral is written up. Yeah. Was there another way? to redirect that child, you know, intentional courage, standing on your core beliefs. Another thing that I want to mention is really making certain that we build strong teams. My sister, assistant principal, Equetta Jones, um, she's been Delaware's 
assistant principal of the year for this past year, 2020. I just had to throw that in there. Um, but the one thing I said, if we don't do anything else, if we don't build strong teams and teach people how to love on each other, teach people how to be intentional about taking care of one another. Here we are in COVID, we're COVID fatigue, home fatigue, remote fatigue, Zoom fatigue. We're fatigued over the fatigue. But if we can teach people how to lean on each other, think about it when you were little, you were most successful when you were on a, a, a volleyball team, a softball team, a double dutch team. You had somebody rallying around you. Your health was good. You showed up whether or not you felt like it because you knew your friend would be there. If you teach people how to have good teams and support your teams, then the culture will begin to evolve. But just think about that. Those things don't cost financial pieces intentional courage on your core beliefs that you develop as a school. That's key. Amen. And someone will take the mantle, right? They just yes. fall and keep running. And then it just cascades. And then you have teachers owning it and the scholars owning it and the families owning it. Yes. And it's like, wow, when we know it ebbs and it flows, but it's always there. The core is on change. Always Woo! Mm, we're teaching and preaching. Sharon Wells. <laughs> <laughs> one of my mentors. You said that we have to teach one another how to love on each other. Mm -hmm. And you all talked about punishment. And in hearing that, you took me back to Marva Collins in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And Marva Collins said that when she started her school, one of the things that she did was when a, when a child would act up, she would have them take out the dictionary and write in alphabetical order all of the words, the affirming words that spoke to their brilliance and their beauty and their giftedness. Mm -hmm. I am amazing. I am awesome. And they had to go from A to Z. She said every time they did it or every time they misbehaved, they had to do, they had to do the same thing over and over again to the point that they got tired of writing about how awesome they were. Yes. And they started living it and being it. Yes. The truth is we have to be the change that we want to see. Yes. We have Every to create day. the environment and the community and the culture. We Every have to be the example. Every day we have to live it. We have to breathe it. Yes. We have to model it. Every day we have to teach it. We have to teach teachers how to be able to work with one another and to unify. And that was really key during this time, canoeing these mountains, canoeing all of the mountains that we had to go through this year. We had to teach people. This is what good leaders did. They had to canoe the mountains and they had to teach people how to work on teams and keep those teams together, whether it be an electronic or in person, whether you're remote or in Zoom, we had to do that. And we also have to do that with children. We have to teach also our teams. We have to teach our teachers how to restore the relationship. And that's what you do, right? Mm -hmm. After infraction happened, you know, it's gonna happen. An infraction is gonna happen. Something, a, a bad choice will happen, right? Kids may, we've been here since Cain and Abel. These things are going to happen, right? But we have to teach our teachers how to restore the relationship. You hurt me when you did that and I still love you, but right now you go to your buddy classroom and I'll see you in about 15 minutes, right? So we have to go back and teach those teachers how to restore that relationship after those things have happened. And that's a new phenomenon that's coming out, that restorative practices. It's a new phenomenon, but I think that this is this is the place for us to go um, as educators, as we're dealing with our children coming from so many different cultures and climates and things of this sort. This is this is really the work uh, in which we're steaded. This is the headed. This is the current issue uh, and trend that we see with uh, schools and, and loving children. Completely agree with you. Actually, we are in the process over the past uh, two years of getting that restorative circles training for all of our staff members, no matter what capacity you work um, in, uh, in the building. And one of my mentors, uh, Jerry Mahoney, she always says, uh, and she's my assistant principal mentor, that you know, kids don't learn from teachers that they don't like. So it is all about love, the pedagogy of love. love is and so, you know, we have one more question in the Q and A. 
And I think that this is a great question for us to um, close out on. And it's also a tough one to answer um, because we all know education is very political. Education leadership is very political. And so the question in the chat is, how do you navigate the politics of education? Especially when the influences the decisions that your superiors in a way that is not in the best interest of the children. So how do you navigate those politics? How do you deal with the challenging community member who might be a person of influence that has an idea that goes against your school's core values or your school mission? What are some of the things that you all do? I mean, I'll start. Um, I think first, um, going back to relationships, so that when I need to navigate those political waters, I have some relationship capital built in there so I can go have those difficult conversations and have those frank conversations. That's a part of it. But um, I think that the bigger part is understanding my responsibility does not allow me to not go into that when it's necessary. Um, I, I can't lead courageously and then say, I'm not going to have this conversation because it's political. I'm not going to push this issue because it's the wrong people. Now, there's always a way to do it. And my mom always said, you know, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Mm -hmm. But the conversation needs to be held because the children are hurt. The children are in danger. The children are being harmed. And I think that part of the responsibility of this position sitting in this seat is pushing back when necessary because we can't allow the children to be harmed because we're afraid to have the conversation. And yes, it's political. And yes, it can, it can be, I, I think sometimes people are concerned that it can be career damaging, um, but our children are at stake. And when it comes down to our children being at stake, we have to lead courageously to have those conversations, to push back. And like I said, some of it's you build the relationship on the front end and, and it's not always waiting for the situation to take place, right? So you start having conversations now about the cultures and the building that lead to these situations taking place. So when something comes up, you've already started to lay the foundation of where the change needs to take place. And so I think that that's a big part of it, but I, I'll go back to the biggest piece being, there's a responsibility when you sit in the seat to speak for those that don't have a voice, our children and our families that are not, that are not at the table to have that voice. And so therefore it's, it's my responsibility, it's our responsibility as leaders to jump into that, to push where necessary, because if not us, then who's going to do it? I would like to extend that thinking. I, when, when I hear that question, I think of it in two ways. I think of it as A, where you're navigating politics from those who are quote unquote your supervisors, right? Who may have made decisions that are not in the best interest of children on the ground, at the micro level in schools, because sometimes we see that there's a disconnect between what we call the central office or the, the oversight of what's happening in schools without a deep enough understanding of the interplay and the different factors. What does it really look like on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think the way to navigate that, so one of the pieces that I'm always mindful of against is, is self-awareness is to be aware of where the blind spots are or the landmines are, and it's to still stand on what is right for kids. And I would even say this to my teachers, if you break the rules for kids, I don't mean rogue, but for example, if you want to tutor a child and you're, you know, you whatever it is, Right, we know what we mean by break the rules within a reason, not rogue out there on a limb doing what you want to do, saying this is good for kids. So I think we have to be mindful and be strategic, strategy, and have some elements in our toolbox, strategic thinking. We need allies, we need to create allies, we need to find purpose pushers. And so when we get these edicts that are not right for children, we need to find a way to do that because that's a part of the job, but do the other thing that's right for children, right? We've got to get in there and make a way. And that's what relationships are. We can do this, but then there's a compromise. What's the other part of this that now I need to go and ensure so that I can get the outcome that I desire? And that might be a harder part of the work, but we do it because again, we're working for children. And I think sometimes leaders do not wish to um, engage in this work because it's hard work. 
but go find your strategy, go find your allies, go find your coalition and be innovative. Like we've got to think outside the box. So that's one aspect. The other piece is when you are the leader and something is happening, it might be from the community or from within the school. When we decided that Parkway Center City should become a middle college, it was a lot of pushback, believe it or not, from the staff. I thought, oh my God, what an idea, you know, because the truest way out of poverty is can these scholars get an associate's degree? That would be a pathway out of poverty. Philadelphia is still one of the largest the poorest big cities in America. And it was surprising that some adults, they were like, oh, but what about my job? And I had so much dissonance because I could not connect to that idea. I didn't care about my job. We cared about the scholars getting their associate's degree as a pathway out. Like that's the truest goal of education is empowering yourself at the highest manifestation of who you are. And they were stuck. And so how do we help people unstuck? And that might require information. It might require conversation. It might require the peers. So the teachers who were on board, they became the cultural brokers, the bridge builders with their peers. And for those who would not want to come along, then you know, you just got to leave them and say, thank you for your service. We'll take it from here. And that's just real talk, right? So after we have done, because remember, it's do no harm. So we're doing no harm with, 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 with all the stakeholders, our colleagues, our families, our children. But we have to do that strategic conversation, the ally building, the coalition building, or we've got to do that honest label and say, thank you for your service. We'll take it from here. And that's how we navigate. And be self-aware. Know yourself and get your ego you know i always say don't take anything personal and it's hard you know because you want to be like oh i'm so special but you know when you work with young people i was saying to someone that i can no longer be offended because i've worked with children and children don't care sharon wells and they don't care yana dixon and jamina clay and Krishan fitzgerald if you have a doctorate or not they 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 really are not as interested in the college you went to if you were in the ivies or first tier or not they they admire it but that's not what they care about who we are who you are inside if they like you if you're kind to them because they see us for who we tr truly are you know and so i think that that's an important point that we have to know who we are in this fight because then we become better fighters for kids to navigate the politics. And we have to be willing to say, sometimes you gotta say on this, Dr. Ackerman would say, I'm, I'm not afraid to be fired. Now I'm not telling people to run out and get fired. You got bills to pay. But sometimes you gotta say on this, this much is true. And on this, I will not compromise. On this, I will not. This is a no for me. And we have to be okay with that. Thank you. Well, I wish I had all of these ladies about five or 10 years ago. Oh, gosh, my life would have been so much easier. <laughs> so I, I agree with everybody, but I'm going to tell you something that I had to learn the hard way. Um, I, no one, there is no course in managing politics as an educational leader. But it is, it, it, there is a really big need uh, for that topic. And nobody tells you, you need to know your allies, you need to know your strategies. You know how it's, it is when you're in a small building, you see a small building, who's really running the building? You need to know, the Bible says you got to be sharp as a, humble as a, uh, humble as a dove, but sharp as a snake. You got to know really who is the political puller in that particular community. And you really have to be in tune with that community. You know how you get a small building, who's really running the building? The secretary, <laughs> the chief custodian. And it's the same thing, right? When you get to that larger macro level, who is really the political pusher? Who is really the your ally there? And so that's something that you really need to learn, uh, uh, definitely as an aspiring administrator. That was was very hard for me because I'm not a Wilmingtonian and Wilmingtonians and Delawareans, they're very loyal to Wilmingtonians and Delawareans. Here I am, this girl from DC. I grew up, I could see the monument out of my window when I was a little girl. But 
I had no idea what, what where the four-man meal was in, in Wilmington, Delaware. So you have to really know the political structure for the place for where you're trying to get your movement and your traction. Nobody ever told me that. And once you find out who that is, you have to build relationships, just like Jamina Clay said. You have to build relationships. You have to figure out who it is and figure out how to build relationships. Just And we start teaching in kindergarten, right? We teach kindergarten. You have to learn how to be nice to your friends and, and say nice things. And everything you learn in kindergarten, you have to take with you, even at this level, right? At this level, you have to build relationships. I have a relationship and I love uh, my district office staff and I am very intentional about building relationships there. I love my community around me and I have to be very intentional about building the relationship here. I was at a school uh, for five years that was not even a mile away. Totally different political structure. And I had to learn that about 10 years ago. And that was really hard for me. So if I could drop one nugget, that's my, that's my big nugget. But I think that we have to lean on our core beliefs. And that's easier if you as a leader have already had some proven results, right? Like you can't go and bust up a school and, and, and do a really poor job and then go and tell somebody that you're about to change the whole trajectory of the way the thing is about to go. No. You know, you get autonomy, you get some leverage when you get results. When you get results and you get data, then you can go to another location and say, here's where I think we need to move so that this generation and that generation will now see this. Because the work that we do is not just for us. The work that we do is, the work is for generations. The work is for families, the human condition, right? So I would just definitely say that, especially to an aspiring administrator. And I'm going to stop talking because I think I'm, you know, I, I, I can go on for days and days. But learn who your political pull is in your area. Learn it. Spend time with it. Make friends. Make friends. It's very hard. Stand on your core beliefs and whatever you do, high moral and ethical standards. Don't get in there and get too faced. Mm. Don't turn your back on these kids. Don't do it. Pia Cooper says that my guidance counselor, uh uh, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't turn your back on your high moral and ethical standards. We know how we were raised. We have standards and stand on them. Can I just say, I think, um, you know, you all have a much longer career than I do in this business. And so I have been inspired and encouraged by everything that I've heard. And so I want to say, I don't know who asked the question or how long they've been uh, in education, but I just want to say it's also okay to be quiet and to listen. Listening is a powerful skill and it's piggybacking off of what you said because sometimes you just have to be still and be quiet and listen and observe so that when you do speak you are going to do something you're going to say something that you know will make a difference yeah you know, when you first asked the question Sharon I was thinking you know well you know ground yourself in your why and say it anyway and I'm glad I didn't say that see I listened first because sometimes it's important, depending on where you are. And, and like you said, if you have um, you know, a track record that you can speak to, it's really best to listen and to continue to learn. We have to continue to be lifelong learners. And you know, no matter how far we go in our careers, we have to continue to learn and to listen to each other. Ladies, I would like to thank you all. This has been an amazing conversation that is just like so full of passion. Um, I can tell that each of you loves what you do, love the work and do the work for the children and keep that at the front of what you do. And so I just wanna say thank you um, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to my distinguished colleagues. Thank you so much. We still, we always stand in service to children. Thank you and families. Thank you, Sharon Wells. So Thank much. you, Creed. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank I have you. totally enjoyed being around all of this greatness. There's a seed of greatness on the line. And I love it. And I love each and every one of you. And I wish you well in service to our children. Thank you to serve. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share and join these wonderful colleagues. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And so Dr. Wall.